Welcome to Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story, where we answer the questions you have about your favorite classic authors. What inspired your favorite author to write their novels? What was going on in the world at the time? Follow along with us as we tell you what was happening in the world while your favorite authors wrote your favorite classics. My name is Bree Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. If you want to know what's coming next and vote on upcoming books, sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. Be sure to follow my show on your favorite podcast platform so you get all the new episodes. You can find most of our links in the show notes, but also our website, biteatatimebooks.com, includes all of the links for our show, including to our Patreon to support the show and YouTube, where we have special behind the narration of the episodes. We're part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you'd also like to hear a book by the author, check out the Bite at a Time Books podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Today we'll be talking about Mary Shelley's return to England and writing career. After her husband's death, Mary Shelley lived for a year with Lee Hunt and his family in Genoa, where she often saw Byron and transcribed his poems. She resolved to live by her pen and for her son, but her financial situation was precarious. On July 23, 1823, she left Genoa for England and stayed with her father and stepmother in the Strand, until a small advance from her father-in-law enabled her to lodge nearby. Sir Timothy Shelley had at first agreed to support his grandson, Percy Florence, only if he were handed over to an appointed guardian. Mary Shelley rejected this idea instantly. She managed instead to wring out of Sir Timothy a limited annual allowance, which she had to repay when Percy Florence inherited the estate. But to the end of his days, he refused to meet her in person and dealt with her only through lawyers. Mary Shelley busied herself with editing her husband's poems, among other literary endeavors, but concern for her son restricted her options. Sir Timothy threatened to stop the allowance if any biography of the poet were published. In 1826, Percy Florence became the legal heir of the Shelley estate after the death of his half-brother, Charles Shelley, his father's son by Harriet Shelley. Sir Timothy raised Mary's allowance from £100 a year to £250 a year, but remained as difficult as ever. Mary Shelley enjoyed the stimulating society of William Godwin's circle, but poverty prevented her from socializing as she wished. She also felt ostracized by those who, like Sir Timothy, still disapproved of her relationship with Percy Bysshe Shelley. In the summer of 1824, Mary Shelley moved to Kentish Town in North London to be near Jane Williams. She may have been, in the words of her biographer Muriel Spark, a little in love with Jane. Jane later disillusioned her by gossiping that Percy had preferred her to Mary, owing to Mary's inadequacy as a wife. Around this time, Mary Shelley was working on her novel, The Last Man, 1826, and she assisted a series of friends who were writing memoirs of Byron and Percy Shelley, the beginnings of her attempts to immortalize her husband. She also met the American actor John Howard Payne and the American writer Washington Irving, who intrigued her. Payne fell in love with her and in 1826 asked her to marry him. She refused, saying that after being married to one genius, she could only marry another. Payne accepted her rejection, and tried without success to talk his friend Irving into proposing himself. Mary Shelley was aware of Payne's plan, but how seriously she took it is unclear. In 1827, Mary Shelley was party to a scheme that enabled her friend Isabel Robinson and Isabel's lover, Mary Diana Dodds, who wrote under the name David Lindsay, to embark on a life together in France as husband and wife. With the help of Payne, whom she kept in the dark about the details, Mary Shelley obtained false passports for the couple. In 1828, she fell ill with smallpox while visiting them in Paris. Weeks later, she recovered unscarred, but without her youthful beauty. During the period of 1827 to 40, Mary Shelley was busy as an editor and writer. She wrote the novels The Fortunes of Perkin Warbeck, 1830, Lodore, 1835, and Faulkner, 1837. She contributed five volumes of Lives of Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, and French authors to Lardner's Cabinet Cyclopedia. She also wrote stories for ladies' magazines. She was still helping to support her father, and they looked out for publishers for each other. 
1830, she sold the copyright for a new edition of Frankenstein for 60 pounds to Henry Colburn and Richard Bentley for their new standard novel series. After her father's death in 1836 at the age of 80, she began assembling his letters and a memoir for publication, as he had requested in his will. But after two years of work, she abandoned the project. Throughout this period, she also championed Percy Shelley's poetry, promoting its publication and quoting it in her writing. By 1837, Percy's works were well-known and increasingly admired. In the summer of 1838, Edward Moxon, the publisher of Tennyson and the son-in-law of Charles Lamb, proposed publishing a collected works of Percy Shelley. Mary was paid £500 to edit the Poetical Works, 1838, which Sir Timothy insisted should not include a biography. Mary found a way to tell the story of Percy's life nonetheless. She included extensive biographical notes about the poems. Shelley continued to practice her mother's feminist principles by extending aid to women whom society disapproved of. For instance, Shelley extended financial aid to Mary Diana Dodds, a single mother and illegitimate herself who appears to have been a lesbian and gave her the new identity of Walter Sholto Douglas, husband of her lover Isabel Robinson. Shelley also assisted Georgiana Paul, a woman disallowed for by her husband for alleged adultery. Shelley in her diary about her assistance to the latter, I do not make a boast. I do not say aloud, behold my generosity and greatness of mind. For in truth, it is simple justice I perform, and so I am still reviled for being worldly. Mary Shelley continued to treat potential romantic partners with caution. In 1828, she met and flirted with the French writer Prosper Merimé, but her one surviving letter to him appears to be a deflection of his declaration of love. She was delighted when her old friend from Italy, Edward Trelawney, returned to England, and they joked about marriage in their letters. Their friendship had altered, however, following her refusal to cooperate with his proposed biography of Percy Shelley, and he later reacted angrily to her omission of the atheistic section of Queen Mob from Percy Shelley's poems. Oblique references in her journals, from the early 1830s until the early 1840s, suggest that Mary Shelley had feelings for the radical politician Aubrey Beauclerk, who may have disappointed her by twice marrying others. Mary Shelley's first concern during these years was the welfare of Percy Florence. She honored her late husband's wish that his son attend public school, and with Sir Timothy's grudging help, had him educated at Harrow. To avoid boarding fees, she moved to Harrow-on-the-Hill herself so that Percy could attend as a day scholar. Though Percy went on to Trinity College, Cambridge, and dabbled in politics and the law, he showed no sign of his parents' gifts. He was devoted to his mother, and after he left university in 1841, he came to live with her. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books behind the story today. While we answered some of the questions you have about one of your favorite classic authors, again, my name is Bree Carlisle, and I hope you come back next time when we answer more questions about one of your favorite classic authors. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. Check out the show notes or our website biteatatimebooks.com for the links for our show.